Um, if you're interested in Wellesley Neighbors and you're on Zoom, go to the wellesleyneighbors.org website. You'll find lots of interesting information and how to get in contact and join us. Um, tonight's event is being... Wellesley Media is taping tonight's event and we'll make it available to everybody on YouTube. So it's now my pleasure to introduce a member of Wells, a leading member of Wellesley Neighbors who will introduce our speaker. Good evening. One group right here, numerous, and another one even more numerous over there in the wind. Uh, I guess it was last fall, I ran into John Plotz, who's an old friend of mine, an old colleague at Brandeis, and uh, we were happy to see each other. We were at the library. No, we were at, um, at MFA, the museum, and uh, we, we talked for a while because we were catching up. I've been retired for quite a while now, and, uh, and he just keeps going on. And uh, I thought at a certain point later in the semester, semester is his, his life. My life was later in the fall semester, uh, this, the fall, uh, I thought, you know, maybe we should invite him to our lecture series here, uh, Wellesley Neighbors. Uh, he might be able to say something interesting. I'm sure he would. So I, I invited him, he graciously accepted, and we finally got the date together and put it all together. Now, John is a um, professor of the humanities, specifically the Barbara Mandel Professor of the Humanities. Mandel is the name of the uh, building in which English and, and a few other uh, departments hold, hold their, uh, their offices. He was uh, a graduate, he's a graduate of Harvard, PhD at Harvard, I think Princeton for undergraduate, is that right? Harvard. Harvard again, he's an all Harvard man. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> He's taught at, at Princeton, though, I know that. Uh, he works in the fields of Victorian literature and the novel, politics, and aesthetics. He's the director of graduate studies. He is the co-founder of the Brandeis Educational Justice Initiative, which deals with uh, the criminal justice system in America. And uh, as I'm learning tonight from him, uh, <clears throat> they deal with uh, working with people in the jail system uh, in, in the state of Massachusetts. He uh, is a co-host of, quote, Recall This Book, unquote, which is a podcast. And from what I can gather, it seems to go on forever. There are numerous, <laughs> endless episodes on any topic you want. New media, minimalism, addiction, Circe. Circe, you know, the siren in, in the, the Odyssey. Uh, <clears throat> John likes to talk. I've determined that that is the one thing he loves to do because he's had so many podcasts, I couldn't even begin to tell you how many, let alone mention their titles. Uh, he's the master of the podcast, actually. He has conversations on all these topics, and he does, them, does these conversations with other people. He's, you know, he's involved with several different people on different occasions. Uh, there so, are other people there. It's not a conversation. He, it would just be a soliloquy. Yeah, it would. That's right. I was going to say it's a it's, um, um, self-defining tautological statement that I made there. Uh, but anyhow, uh, he uh, is, I'm not going to tell you what he wrote. He's going to probably tell you more about what he's, he's written, uh, what he's published. Uh, I'm going to tell you about what he's interested in doing next, and that is the title of his current project is Non-Human Being, Post-Darwinian Naturalism, Fantasy, and Science Fiction which he describes as an attempt to trace the legacy of Darwinian, Darwinian natural materialism in the near simultaneous emergence of prose fantasy, science fiction, and natural, naturalist literature, all topics which would interest me. <laughs> and it actually, the title is now Laughter is from Mars. I decided that. Oh, OK. I'm working. I'm working towards the title. I mean, here at the bottom, it's very long. It takes a whole paragraph, but that's fine. Mars. In any case, you might think that our interests are really are not really related at all. I think they're pretty close, closely related, actually. When you consider the fact that, uh, despite the fact that the Middle Ages is my field and his is Victorian uh, literature, mine is Italian, his is English. Despite that fact. 
we both deal with science fiction. After all, isn't Dante's other world uh, journey, yeah. science fiction, totally par example? And really, probably the greatest, most developed science fiction, other world science fiction, that nobody ever talks about as science fiction, because Dante wrote it, it's like gospel. And it's, it's shrouded with um, theolo theological uh, underpinnings, which make it seem less fiction than reality. In any case, the title was Laughing All the Way to the Apocalypse with a subtitle, which I won't mention. And then we're going to recall it. Uh, let's see, we're going to retitle it as uh, Laughing is from Mars. John, thank you. <laughs> oh. Don't thank you. Thank, thank you both for this great introduction. And it's, it's great. Um, to be here in person. I'm really glad there. I mean, it's great that people exist virtually too, but it's so nice to be here in a room with you. And um, yeah, so Richard, I'm so glad you mentioned the Dante connection because I actually have a slide just for you, which was to try to think about that connection. And I, I should say, basically, I'm used to doing two things. I'm used to giving kind of academic talks, which are prepared and argumentative, and then I'm used to sort of teaching with slides. And I couldn't decide which this event was, so I kind of did a toaster oven thing where I have a little bit of the academic frame at the beginning, but then I thought we could work through some slides, which I hope are going to be fun. Um, but you should tell me, maybe by falling asleep or something, if there's too much academic at the beginning, and then I can sort of speed up, because I have way too many slides to get to in, is it half an hour, is that right? And Okay, great. So, so I was going to say, I mean, the other thing is, although I'm a humanist, one thing I got out of the podcast is that the scientists have a really wonderful thing, which is that people hold up their hand in the middle if they have a question. So if there is a point you want to make, like in the middle of a slide, and I'm kind of yammering on, I'm moving to the next slide, but you have a question related to that slide, please, I would be very happy. Just hold up your hand. I, I, I love how scientists gab in that way. And so that's super. Okay, so here are here I'm going to begin with the academic slides. Oh, and I also have an apology, which I've already made to some of you, which is that I got my eyes dilated at noon today, and they told me it would be gone in five hours, but it is not gone. So I'm you are sort of hazy to me. So and that's also true of the things I'm going to be reading. So yeah. Um, so the title for tonight, I just put up this slide because I wanted to have this nice image of the day of the triplets, but. Um, the title is Laughing All the Way to the Apocalypse. And then satirical science fiction, rather than from Kurt Vonnegut to Margaret Atwood, I decided to go further back in tribute to Dante and people like him. So from way back to Margaret Atwood. Um, and here comes the sort of academic setup. So the, the basic setup is that science fiction is not generally funny throughout. I mean, you can think of lots of very earnest science fiction writers. And I think the king of them right now would be somebody like Kim Stanley Robinson, who has this whole series of kind of environmental future novels, which are wonderful. They're deep. They're thoughtful. They are profoundly humorless. However, there is a long tradition of laughter woven in that stretches back maybe to Gulliver's Travels, maybe further. And what I'm trying to show is that that laughter is not just a kind of bonus, you know, like you can ice your cake with some laughter. I actually think the laughter is part of the heart of what a lot of science fiction is trying to do. It is trying to reshape the way that its readers see the world. So the famous phrase um, from Darko Suvin, who's sort of the king of science fiction theory, is that literature, that science fiction uses a novum, a new idea in the world, to produce cognitive estrangement. And by cognitive estrangement, Suvin means that it makes you sort of sit with a strange and different world. And I think that is generally true. But again, Suvin is another one of these humorless people. And for him, the estrangement must be a kind of deep intellectual dedication to what would it be like if we could have a machine that would travel back in time. And so in telling the story of science fiction, he over he kind of leaves aside, for example, in Wells's Time Machine, the, the general goofiness of the bicycle 
that moves, you know, from here into the past or into the future, and you have to be really careful not to stop when there's a hill, because if you stop when there's a hill and you're moving on time and your time machine, you're going to be stuck inside the hill. Like, there's just, a, there's this element of weirdness that somebody like Darko Suvin underestimates. So my idea about science fiction generally is that we should think about it not just as satirical, and so when I say satirical, I think of something like, you know, Gulliver's Travels is a great example of the Lilliputians, yes, and the Brobdignagians, the, the giants, but also the Whinims, the talking horses. And the point about the Whinims, of course, is that they are rational beings who know how, who are homo sapiens. They are like equi sapiens. So the, the Whinims are what human beings think we are, but the yahoos is what we actually are. So that's what I mean by the basic idea of Gulliver's Travels being satire. So it's not just that it's science fiction is satirical, it's also a specific kind of satire. I think it's here on the slide somewhere. Yes, uh, so it is Manipian satire, and I don't know Richard, I'm sure you know what Manipian satire is, but I will just say I didn't know what it was a couple of years ago. Manipian satire, if you think of Swiftian satire, is sometimes also called juvenalian satire. It's incisive, it's cruel, it is sort of deconstructing the way we act in the world. Then there's Horatian satire, which you could think of as more like The Simpsons or something. It's just like gentle, it's... Um, profoundly uh, appreciative of the world, so it's like laughter with a smile. Manipian satire is very different from those two. Manipian satire is not making fun of what we do in the world, it's making fun of what we think about the world. So Manipian satire basically says, you, you are walking around in the dark with a blindfold on and you think you see. So Manipian satire sets out to make fun not of the way we act in the world, but just like our entire model of how we understand the world, it says, is wrong. And so there is this weird category which exists from before science fiction, um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of examples, really early examples, which is the Manipian adventure, which sounds weird because Manipian sounds like it's a kind of high concept, very cerebral way of thinking about the world, but the point about Manipian adventure, and by the way, Margaret Atwood uses that phrase Manipian adventure to describe her own work. The Manipian adventure is a rollicking good time that nonetheless is meant to show you that you're wandering around blindfold, that you understand the world less than you thought you did. So that's basic, that's where I'm going with this intellectually. I want to say that Science fiction has this Manipian, is part of this long Manipian satirical tradition. And then specifically, science fiction in the 20th century, basically ever since H.G. Wells, is also a response to science. So there, uh, Richard, we get to the connection of uh, the, the Dante question, because obviously Dante's not thinking about science, but he is thinking about um, epistemology, He's thinking about kind of the ontology of the world, and Dante has this sort of imaginative adventure that is meant to take you out beyond the realms that we know. The point about science fiction that makes it different from something like Dante is that it's within a world in which science is king. So we have a sort of technological and scientific sense that we can, if not control the whole world, at least know everything about the world. And science fiction, in many ways, is as much designed to kind of deconstruct or tease or poke fun at that as somebody like Chaucer is trying to poke fun at the religious mindset that prevailed in his day. So in other words, science fiction sees itself from below, but the below that it is pointing up to is a world in which science is... I won't say it's a religion, but science is all-powerful in the way that maybe religion was powerful in Europe say 800 years ago. So that is the, so Manipian adventure has a long tradition, but once science and technology really become powerful, so you could think of the age of steam or the age of Victorian technology, that is kind of one bonus where science fiction, the H.G. Wells and Jules Verne style science fiction responds to that. That's one moment that Manipian adventure gets kind of charged. And then the second moment, which 
I'm going to try to get to with Kurt Vonnegut is basically World War II and the Atomic Age. And this is, I guess, the summer of Oppenheimer, and now the winter of Oppenheimer, I guess. So we could think about Oppenheimer as a good paradigm for this, that, that like, once you know, I think he said, I am become what I am become death, the destroyer of worlds is the line that he said. So you think about Oppenheimer as as acknowledging the scientific um, yeah, um, apotheosis, I guess, like the power that the atom bomb had to really show that science and technology were so powerful in the world. And that moment, is very terrifying, and you can look at lots and lots of science fiction, including by people like Isaac Asimov and Robert Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke, that represents the terror of the atom bomb. But I think there's a lot of humor as well. Like, in other words, that you have to laugh in response to this, because if you don't laugh, you're going to cry or you're going to scream. So, so that is the overall intellectual framework. I have a couple more scholarly things to say. Um, yes, OK, I'm going to talk about uh, one phrase uh, that Brian Stableford has that I think helps think about um, the Manipian side of science fiction. He says that from the beginning, science fiction has also been anti-science fiction, like anti-hyphen science fiction. So in other words, that in, the, in the, here we could come back to Gulliver's Travels too, that from the beginning, there was this sense that you were teasing or looking at the order, the orderliness of science from below. And, and this is the point, and actually maybe I'll just skip to the next slide here. This is where I was thinking about um, uh, Dante. Because I was thinking about this guy, Robert Scholes, who's this is the only other, I think, footnote I have today. But so Robert Scholes talks about something called structural fabulation. And so he's also picking up that phrase, cognitive estrangement, that, that Darko Suvin uses. But he says, speculative fabulation was born of humanism and fostered by science. And the idea of speculative fabulation is that in order to really understand this world that in many ways is so far beyond us, that seems, you know, the, if you think about the Galileo's discovery of these moons that must have been at least thousands of miles away, you know, that, you know, f f that moment of discovery of the magnitude of the scientific universe, you needed fabulation to try to wrap it back into order. And so the connection to Dante is that there is this tradition of uh, cosmic fabulation. Um, he calls it dogmatic fabulation, but I actually don't think, I think he also calls, um, I think, I, I think co dogmatic fabulation is what he says Dante is actually trying to kind of work his way out of, but cosmic fabulation exists in a world without science, you still need the need to tell these massive stories. But once you have, the, like once you enter the enlightenment and you have a realm of science, then you really need this structural fabulation that will kind of go to bat, like with science, yes, but also anti-science as well. Um, and then I have another footnote there about basically the idea that we're living inside a science fictional universe nowadays. It's, it's kind of an interesting idea, and maybe we can come back to it at the end, but I think the main point I want to emphasize is that H.G. That Wells, you know, who you guys might know, H.G. Wells, he studied with Huxley as a young man. He was like part of the first uh, uh, of the school of that's the, uh, what's it called, Kensington School of Science and Technology. Like, he's, he's part of this first generation of post-Darwinian industrial science. So H.G. Wells was, like, perfectly poised to, to tell stories of a world in which we're all living, we're all living basically through science and through the technology that science produces and at its behest. So the point that Rone makes is that we've actually hit in the sort of postmodern universe, we've hit a world where we're, we're just bewildered by, so bewildered by what science has been able to do that in a sense, even science feels like science fiction to us. And I think Margaret Atwood is a good example of that, that notion that like the things that, that bioengineering, that CRISPR, you know, Margaret Atwood writes about CRISPR, the things that CRISPR can do are so amazing that they themselves might as well be science fiction. But that, that, so that's sort of like a, a point about maybe the last 10 or 20 years. But, you know, let me start with the point about H.G. Wells. Okay, so 
I realize I haven't said anything funny yet. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I'm getting there. This is my setup. Um, so any thoughts or questions that anyone want to? Okay, so let me, uh, so let me talk. Uh, okay, so this actually, I'm going to come back to this quote at the end. This is the moment that Sputnik was launched. Hannah Arendt, who's really sort of my hero, like I think through and with Hannah Arendt about pretty much everything. So the moment that Sputnik was launched, which is the time that the human condition was introduced, Sci uh, Hannah Arendt mentions science fiction. It's very early scholarly mention of science fiction. Like no one really talked about science fiction, which existed, clearly existed as a genre at least since H.G. Wells. So let's say the 1880s, but nobody really studied it until the era of Sputnik. And that's interesting to me. So she says that basically this non-respectable literature of science fiction has something to tell us that other discourses about science and technology don't. And so that's a different version of what I'm trying to say, that I think science fiction, by way of its goofy adventureness, is weaving in between somewhat sort of respectable alternatives. So let me say a little bit about what I think those respectable alternatives are. One of them is, and they're both kind of unfunny, and one of them is the notion of celebrating science, which we all do all the time. I mean, I was, I was telling Richard, my dad was an immunologist. I grew up in the NIH world. I love science. I love being exposed to just kind of the glories of science. So I just thought about a book I love. I don't know, do people know this book, Other Minds by Peter Godfrey Smith? This is a wonderful book about octopuses and how their thinking is just radically different from humans, and yet they're profoundly intelligent. And we can see that there's all sorts of amazing tests you can do, which will establish, um, you know, their the difference of their intelligence. And so Godfrey Smith makes the point that you know he doesn't say we don't need science fiction. He says, but you know, he actually says when you compare it to science fiction, it's interesting to think about meeting an octopus because this is actually what meeting an intel. This is a real chance to meet an intelligent alien. So, totally get that. That is the positive vision of science as the thing that is constantly stretching the edges of our knowledge. And you know, I'm the kind of person who's always like typing into Google, you know oldest cave art to find out if they've discovered, you know, carvings from like 70,000 BC. Maybe there was Neanderthal cave art. That's incredible. How do we know it was Neanderthal rather than Homo sapiens? So that's the sort of celebratory side of things. And then I, I thought about using Heidegger here, but I ended up with Dostoevsky. The notion of the critique of science as instrumental reason. And um, I think maybe in the interest of time, I will not go through this whole quote. But you know, you probably um, know that those sort of late 19th century Russians were not just because they were sort of anti-France or because they were working out their conflicted relationship to the West, but both Dostoevsky and Tolstoy have these really interesting sort of hostility to the mechanistic and deterministic account of the laws of nature. Like in Notes from Underground, I didn't include this quote, but he says, you know, the, the scientists will tell you two plus two equals four, but damn it, two plus two equals five is also a nice thing to say occasionally. You know, that idea that you will have something that does not conform to the rigid determined structure of, um, of science. So I mentioned Heidegger because his, this is the whole notion that like technology, you know, he basically has an account of like Western instrumental reason, which says that, you know, we are trapping ourselves inside an iron cage with, by adhering to science. So there's this vision of science as doing this terrible thing and then there's this vision of science as, as doing the wonderful thing of the octopus thinking. Um, and what I'm saying is not that science fiction splits the difference. It's more like science fiction does both of those things at once. It's interested in both the terrible and the wonderful. So let me start with some examples. OK, so here is, I just, this, I just think this is a funny passage. I hope you will agree. But it's from about 1950, about Sputnik era, too. And it's um, Stanislaw Lem, who's famous for writing Solaris, a rather unfunny science fiction novel about an, a giant planet that is intelligent. But he also wrote these wonderful books. He wrote two sets of books, which are basically very much like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So there's one called The Star Diaries, and then there's one called Tales of Pirx the Pilot. But they're both the same. They have um, this sort of 
every man, sort of schlubby, good soldier, Schweik style, every man who is a spaceman, who's just kind of wandering around trying to do well in the universe and always putting his foot in it. So here is a way that Pierks puts his foot into this particular adventure. So he's there, he's at an interplanetary conference in order to plead for the importance of humanity and why it deserves to be recognized as one of the great intelligent species of the universe. And he says, um, uh, sorry, I said Pierks, but it's Elon uh, Tichy, the star of the Star Diaries. This was the first interplanetary incident in the history of human diplomacy on the galactic level since what I had taken for a soft drink vending machine, he's trying to put coins into this person, turned out to be the deputy chairman of the rock delegation in full regalia. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's where we humans are. We can't really tell a soft drink machine from an ambassador. Um, and I informed the rock deputy chairman proudly, we consider that man should be the measure of all things. He placed a heavy claw on my knee. Why man? And I thought about, actually, Laughter is from Mars. I'm not that crazy about the title, so I thought about calling it Why Man, actually. And I think the reason that's a good joke, and, and by the way, I'm going to say that the humor I'm talking about, I hope it will seem funny in this room, but the main point I want to make is that it seemed funny at the time. You know, like, so that, that it was intended to be funny. Um, uh, so the joke of Why Man, I think, is that that phrase, that man is the measure of all things, we, I mean, growing up, I was taught, like, this is the sign of the apotheosis of the Enlightenment. Like, it used to be that we thought the universe, like, in Dante's era, was ruled by a divine god who ordered things, and there were, you know, flights of seraphim who, who made sure the universe was this way. But we broke out of that, we achieved rationalism, and we discovered that man is the measure of all things. But the science fiction point is that, like, boy, if you still think man is the measure of all things, when you know how wide the universe is and how tiny Earth is, you, you've got a hubris problem. You know, you have a problem of thinking that your epistemology, your kind of human-centered scale, translates into, you know, a, a persuasive ontology for the whole universe. Like, you, you are mixing up the, your centrality to your own experience with your centrality to the universe at large. So that's kind of my example of like how the humor of science fiction operates, like how it demystifies, how it decenters. So a, a one way of thinking about this is, um, you know, it's, it's anti-anthropocentric, like science fiction's innately anti-anthropocentric. Okay. So, yes. Uh, and in fact, Stanislaw Lem, this is a good example of like, Stanislaw Lem actually says that the the novel in Solaris, he says that the novel struggles with the temptations of a latent anthropocentrism. So in other words, Stanislaw Lem does have a different novel which says what he wants to do. But, uh, and I love Solaris. I think it's a great novel, but it, it isn't funny. So to me, like this why man, like that really draws the anti-anthropocentric point beautifully, whereas talking about the temptations of a latent anthropocentrism in the novel doesn't really do it. So I like a novel that thinks on its feet or that thinks with a laugh, I guess. So I have a few uh, slides here about satire. But OK, I want to talk. So now is the point where I'm going to try to talk through a, long, a way back history of science fiction. And this is where I make the kind of implausible claim that you actually can think about science fiction before science, like that there's a tradition of speculative fiction in which the speculation involves doing things that if they happen nowadays, we would call them science fiction. So there are a lot of trips to the moon in previous generations. And I know I said science fiction requires science to push back against it, but there are trips to the moon. So how do we think about these trips to the moon? And one of the things that's really interesting about these trips to the moon, and in fact, I'm actually going to give a paper at a narrative theory conference, which is literally about, it's called Lunar Affordances. It's about why science fiction, why people like to set science fiction stories on the moon. So the thing about stories about trips to the moon, okay, first of all, in this story from 150 AD, they travel to the moon with these giant lunar spiders and they like ride the silk filaments of the spiders to the moon. So that is cool. I mean, it's amazing that, they, that Lucian had this 
crazy sort of um, Nickelodeon cartoon imagination. And I love that. But also when they get to the moon, they, um, uh, they arrive here, they, they sail past the pillars of Hercules, um, well, we know where that is, right? Gibraltar, through the air. And on the 8th, we saw a large tract of land suspended in the atmosphere like an island. It was bright and spherical and bathed in strong light. Um, I think in Paradise Lost, as the moon is described similarly when Satan comes there. There was also another land below us with cities, rivers, seas, forests, and mountains. This we supposed to be our Earth. And the land we had arrived at was what appeared as the moon from Earth. So why is that, maybe not ha-ha funny, but like why is that unsettling? It's unsettling because this, this trope is that your moon is my earth, my earth is your moon. Like if I live on a planet and I see another planet up in the sky, I'm not going to say, oh, there's earth, I'm on the moon. I'm always going to say, there's the moon, I'm on earth. And that is a point that Lucian gets, that from the perspective of the moon man, he is the moon man, basically. Um, there are some other jokes uh, in Lucian which I think similarly show him playing around in a Manipian way with a basic assumptions that we make about how the world works. So, of course, I would like that it's beautiful to be bald if you're on the moon, but I think the point is that if we look up at the sky on the, we see the moon, it looks very bald. So it makes sense to us that up there they would value baldness. And by the same token, people like hair on comets. And that, if people know their Greek etymology, the word for comet is a hairy star. So Lucian is saying that, of course, on the hairy star, they would like people to be very hairy. So it's that, you know, that idea that, you know, if there's, um, if there's a god of the horses, that god has four legs and a tail. Um, uh, there's a joke about Plato, because Plato, of course, is famously against extravagant stories. And Plato says, um, sorry, I should keep an eye on the time here. Um, and Plato says um, that he just sits there in a land of his own devising. So in other words, Lucian sees Plato as opting out of this world of extravagant stories. And he just writes him into the story. He has him sitting in a corner by himself, ignoring everybody else. Um, OK, so I'm taking more time than I thought I would. I, I guess I'll go a little faster than I had planned. But I'll, I'll just say really quickly, there's another wonderful Journey to the Moon by Cyrano de Bergerac. Um, I was obliged to tell them that their world was merely a moon. Same idea. Also, they refuse to believe he's a human being since he's walking on two legs. We don't, like, humans don't do that. Only animals walk on two legs. So that sort of cultural relativity joke is a big um, is like a big trope, and you know he quotes Aristotle. He's like he tries to argue with the moon moon men by quoting Aristotle. Um, I really would love to talk about Margaret Cavendish. There's just a brand new biography of Margaret Cavendish. I don't know if anybody saw that. And there's a novel about her, which actually is called Margaret the First. Um, Margaret Cavendish is I don't know. Do you ever Richard? Do you ever teach her? Is there, yeah, so she's like writing, same time as Afra Bain, she's writing in the 1660s, 70s, 80s. She's very rich. She was like the Duke of Newcastle, is one of the richest men in England. So that sort of explains how a woman would get to be a published writer. But she was a scientist. She wrote about astronomy. She wrote about mathematics. And then she wrote this thing called The Blazing World. And The Blazing World is just hilarious. And part of what is hilarious about it is that she tells people that it is her world since she made it up. So that's w the significance of her saying, I'm going to be Margaret the first. Like, I don't get to be a king, but because I made up this world, I can make myself queen of the world. She also calls it a Kabbalah, a romantical Kabbalah, which is, so she's using this, like, image of Jewish holy texts to try to situate what her invention is doing. Um, so I'd love to say more about her if we want to talk about her. Um, then, OK, yes, I, I had a lot to say about Gulliver's Travels. Maybe I'll just try to say it. And, and actually, I said some of it already. But maybe I'll just try to say it by way of images. So these are the stories that we know, the Lilliputian stories. Um, but there is also the Academy of Legato, which is sometimes cited as a perfect instance of Manipian fables. And do, if you remember, the, they, they spend a lot of time trying to extract sunlight from cucumbers. That's their main <laughs> idea. Um, 
And they also have these sacks. Do you guys remember why they have these sacks? Because they don't, they think language is inherently really slippery. So that if you want to explain what something is, you just have to bring around a, a picture, an image of it. So like if you want to say house, you can't say the word house, you just have to pick up a house and show it to people. So this, these are the academicians. So clearly Swift is playing with the ways in which we think we know what thinking is. You know, I think that's the Manipian point. We think we know what thinking is, but if you look at it a little bit, you realize it kind of disintegrates in your hands. Um, and then, of course, I mean, I guess I could talk forever about the one, partly because my daughter has, like, devoted her life to horses. But, you know, the horses are the rational beings, and then he identifies. While Gulliver is there, he identifies with the Quinnums. He thinks he's a horse. Do you remember he builds a stable for himself when he gets back home? But, of course, he's actually a Yahoo. And, in fact, it turns out they've given him clothing to wear, and at a certain point he realizes with horror that he's wearing Yahoo skin. Like, that's what he's wearing. Like, his shoes are made out of Yahoo. So, right, I mean, it's very unsettling. It's, it is, I do think it's funny, but it's funny in a deeply disturbing way. Um, so that's sort of, again, we're still kind of in the run-up to science here. Yeah, okay. I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip Alice in Wonderland, too, much as I would love to talk about her. But I will talk a little bit about Flatland. Do you guys know this book? So this is one of those books that really reminds you that Oh, yeah, there was science fiction in the Victorian period. So this guy, Abbott, religious figure, mathematics instructor at a boys' school, he created this vision of a world which is a totally two-dimensional world. So Flatland, it's written by A Square. It was actually A Square Squared. That must be the... I haven't seen that version. Yeah, I don't know why the square is squared. But it's a world in which everybody exists in two dimensions. And then into that world, suddenly, one day, a small circle comes. It becomes a larger circle. It becomes a larger circle. It becomes a larger circle. It's not actually a circle. It's actually a sphere passing through this flat world. And this blows the mind of A square. He's never met anyone two-dimensional, anyone other than two-dimensional before. But it causes him to realize that his world must actually be a three-dimensional world. Even though he can only perceive in two dimensions, the very fact of this sphere is what teaches him that there must be sphere land as well as flat land. So here's the image of what it looks like when the sphere comes through. Um, that isn't the only satire of the novel. The novel also imagines that working class men are triangles um, upper class men are like pentagons or hexagons, and then all women are just points. They're just <laughs> spears. So, um, so women. There's a, they, it's incredibly phallic imagery. Actually, talking about women, they're very dangerous because they can pierce men. And the more upper class a man is, the more sides he has, the more vulnerable he is to being pierced by a woman. So, it's the whole thing is a satire about the way we create social categories and make sense of the world. And, and the, one of the things I love about it is that the um, square, having met the sphere and fallen into conversation with the sphere, does not freak out at the fact that there's someone who's more dimensional than him. He asks the sphere to take him to 4D land. He says, I want to meet the super spheres. And the sphere, who's much like us, a three-dimensional being, a perfectly ordinary three-dimensional being, doesn't know what he's talking about. He's like, what do you mean? There is no fourth dimension. And the, the square says, well, I mean, a, a week ago, I thought there wasn't a third dimension. So just because you don't think there's a third dimension doesn't mean there isn't a third dimension, uh, a fourth dimension. There probably is. So how do we find the fourth dimension? And if we get to the fourth dimension, I would like to meet the people from the fifth dimension. So uh, you guys perhaps know the word tesseract from a swiftly tilting planet or the notion of the hypercube, which is if you imagine a cube in three dimensions, what would a cube look like in four dimensions? Like if it had an additional axis. Um, I have a, oh shoot, I have a Dali image of, he has, he has a picture of Jesus uh, crucified on a hypercube actually. Um, so, so in any case, that's from Flatland. So flat, there's, there's Abbott, and then there's another guy who wrote a book called Plainland, and they are basically a, gay, a guy named Edgar Hinton, and they are thinking through hyperdimensional geometry, but they are doing it by way of these science fiction texts. So Flatland, 
He visits Lineland. He ultimately visits Pointland. And then they don't get to the blessed realm of the fourth dimension. But you get the sense from Abbott that the point of the, the joke is to point at the limitations of our three-dimensional way of thinking. It's not, I mean, actually, sci mathematicians have had a field day with Flatland, so there's lots of wonderful stuff written about the math of Flatland. But I really think his point is not to let us conceptualize Flatland. It's to make us reconceptualize our own Spheerland or our own 3D-ness. OK, all of which is still pre-1900. I'm not going to talk about Mark Twain's 3,000 Years Among the Microbes, which is about an entire civilization that takes place inside the left ear of the tramp Blawitzki, outside of a small town in uh, New Hampshire. I can't remember the name of the town. That's a, it's a great one, but I'm going to skip that one. I do want to talk about, really quickly, so H.G. Wells is sort of my guy here for the turning point of the world of the um, what scientists are doing when they create this powerful new world and how we should respond to them. And so he, here's an analogy in the early chapters of this book called The Food of the Gods. The Food of the Gods, the Classics Illustrated does a good job of letting you see what it is. It's food that really makes you grow extremely big, extremely fast. And Unfortunately, chickens and worms are the first people who have access to it. So giant chickens and giant worms start roaming the earth. Things go really bad. But these two scientists are convinced that they're going to make a million dollars and win a Nobel Prize. And even as the giant chickens are like laying waste to the world, they're still like, where's, where's our million dollars? Like, What's the big payoff? So the thing that Wells says, and I think this is so wonderful, he has this image of uh, scientists as coral creatures. And he says, the reef of science that these little scientists, so it's, it's a day when you still put scientists in quotes, that these little scientists built and are yet building is so wonderful, so portentous, so full of mysterious half-shapen promises for the mighty future of man. One does not know which is the most amazing, the greatness or the littleness of these scientific and philosophical men. So to me, that's the point, that that's like the kind of aha moment for Wells, is the greatness and the littleness. So, um, there's, I mean, there's so many wonderful lines that the scientists say, is that like, we, uh, we, we supply the material and they get the experience. Like they're always, they don't really care, it's kind of an Oppenheimer point, they don't care about the consequences. They just want to do really good science and be celebrated by other scientists. And then the fact that it's disaster for the world, that's not really the point. You know, the giant chickens are someone else's problem. <laughs> so, so that's, okay, I really gotta speed up here, but, um, uh, I, there's a W.E.B. Du Bois story that is a very H.G. Wells-like story where he talks about this thing called the megascope. And it's really an amazing racial allegory because the idea is that there are these things that are enormous but invisible right next to us. And we use telescopes to see enormous things that are way off. We use microscopes to see tiny things that are close by. But what we really need is the megascope to allow us to see things like race that are giant and right next to us. So that's the, the Princess Steel by W.B. Du Bois, a very Wellsian story. Um, I want to talk about Carl Chapek, who you guys probably know from Rossum's Universal Robots. But I also he also has this wonderful novel called War with the Newts. I actually just made a coin out of it in the Czech Republic, which makes me happy. But it's about these newts <laughs> that get radiated because of an atomic explosion gone wrong. And this is in the 1930s. And they um, learn Czech, and then they start reading Hegel. And then they basically <laughs> decide to conquer the world. And Chapek is amazing. Um, apparently, he was going to win the Nobel Prize, but the head of the newts was given a little bottle brush mustache. This is in 1935. And the Swedish Academy decided that they couldn't give him the Nobel Prize because Hitler would be too annoyed. Um, he has another wonderful novel called The Absolute at Large, which I would really love to talk about. It is. Basically, the idea is that if you split the atom, not only do you create energy by destroying photons and uh, by destroying protons, but you also release spiritual energy that is trapped inside the atom. And if people are nearby, they become religious. Like they absorb the spiritual energy. So atomic energy leads to religious wars. It's a it's a wonderful kind of convergence of cosmic fabulation and structural fabulation. Okay, um, more about Stanislaw Lem, Italo Calvino. Well, yeah. 
Italo, thank you. Italo, thank you, thank you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Slaughterhouse Five. I guess maybe that I'll stop with Slaughterhouse Five. So, do people know this novel, Slaughterhouse Five? Okay. So I think you might know about it. That it's an incredibly sad story. It's like a trauma story about the bombing of Dresden. So it's about war crimes during World War II, but American war crimes. So that makes it quite distinctive. Um, and of course, people didn't talk about these war crimes even in the '60s when when Vonnegut was writing, but he really sees what the Germans were doing and what the Americans are doing. He, d he wants us to admit that we were doing things, too, that had these horrific structures to them. And so, you know, famously, Vonnegut himself was caught in Dresden. He was a prisoner. He was in a slaughterhouse. And he needed to find a way to tell this story. So he does try for years to write the story of the Dresden bombings as a straight novel. Like it's a, Vonnegut doesn't necessarily see himself as a science fiction novelist. He sees himself as a writer. And he's trying to write about the trauma of the, holo of the, the not the Holocaust, the, the bombing, the aerial bombardments, the slaughter of civilians, the, the, the dance with the children's crusade, the dance with death. The, the, the madness of World War II. He cannot write it as a straight novel, but he starts to be able to write it when he makes up this figure. This is the Trauf Midorians, and these are these weird time-traveling creatures who are shaped like what he calls a plumber's helper and I call a plunger, but that is what they are shaped like. They appear, and they take the central character, Billy Pilgrim, they pull him out of time, and they allow him to move through time and see that time basically has no meaning. And that kind of science fictional, I would call it an affordance, that would be like meaning the kind of gimmick, the, the narrative gimmick of the time-traveling Tralfamadorians tra is who, who are the people who say, so it goes, which is kind of the famous line from Vonnegut. That is what enables him to get out of being trapped inside Slaughterhouse Five. Like other than that, he is this image. He says that people aren't supposed to look back. Um, Lot's wife looked back. She was turned into a pillar of salt. That's what happens if you contemplate atrocity. And and this novel was written by a pillar of salt. So he his idea is that he's trapped still in that moment of the bombardment, the moment of the the the, the crime, kind of like Oppenheimer, you know, with becoming the destroyer of worlds. But science fiction actually untraps him. Like the Tralf Midorians, ridiculous as they are, improbable as they are, are, you know, there's a reason people get this tattoo. It's like it is what lets him out of that miserable loop of like being inside that horrible experience. And instead he's got time travel and he's got this liberation into a third space, which is also, a, you know, a funny space. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I have a whole bunch of quotes. There's a bunch of science fiction novels inside Slaughterhouse Five, which are very funny. And then also, someone says inside Slaughterhouse Five that everything there was to know about life was in the Brothers Karamazov, which coincidentally is also by Dostoevsky. Um, but that isn't enough anymore, said Rosewater. So this idea that we're suddenly living in a world, you know, like when. Karamazov was written in the 19th century, maybe you could just have human wisdom, and human wisdom would get you where you needed to go. But in the world we're living in now, after the Dresden bombing, after the atomic bombs, after the Holocaust, the murder of the Jews, which is also a big obsession of chapter one of Slaughterhouse-Five, that isn't enough. There has to be this other thing. And this other thing could be something very dark. It could be like Stanislaw Lem's latent anthropocentrism. But it isn't. It's more like the rock delegation and why man. It's like the Trough Midorians are just like so different from us. They are the octopuses that arrive and say, you know, this is broken. <laughs> we need some other way to think about the world. Okay, I think I better stop there. <laughs> but thank you, thank you. Sure. Uh, I mean, I. How do we do a discussion here? Or there's a Zoom. They can raise their hands in Zoom. People in Zoom can Eric? raise their hands. Yeah, yeah. People in Zoom can raise their hands. And, yeah. And Eric people can raise their hands. Yeah. And I have a very funny Kurt Vonnegut clip I can play too. If we don't, if we don't have questions, but if we well, do have I, questions, I would say one thing: you yeah. could add into this collaboration of uh, writers, Ariosto. 
Mm. I don't know if you know, there's a trip to the moon in there. No kidding, I didn't know Astolfo that. goes to the moon and he discovers all the lost wisdom of man. He's on the moon. It's up there, not down here on Earth. Wow. So it's a great satire. Yeah. Uh, this is Orlando Furioso? Or? Orlando Furioso, right. Yeah. And it's Midibian also. It's it is. Satire. Yeah. Great, thank and you. There's a whole tradition in the, in, in the Renaissance of Midibian satire and seeing things upside down. You know, taking things as opposite. What was good becomes bad. What is bad becomes good. What is reasonable becomes foolish. What is foolish is actually reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Connecting with all sorts of uh, classical work as well. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, one reason that I really dug into the satire is that there's a general account that says that basically there isn't much satire in the 19th century and then people say oh well maybe Vanity Fair but you know there's an 18th century satirical tradition with people like Gulliver and, and clearly an earlier satirical tradition and then it comes back in the 20th century but when I read a you know something like Flatland or even Alice in Wonderland that there is a strong satirical tradition I just think it goes slightly into the goofy edges you know so it doesn't necessarily get recognized that way but yeah so I it's nice to think about it thank you Hi, yeah. Um, I guess I'm thinking, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this question, but I'm thinking about the, the difference between these, like, the science fiction that's more fantastic science fiction yeah. and the science fiction that's more speculative science fiction. You mentioned um, in the, like, in, in the summary, Orcs of Crate. Yeah. And the, that trilogy is, to me, one of the best things I've ever read in 35 years of knowing how to read. Yeah, and, totally agree, yeah. And, but it's, I think about it at least, I, I read it years ago, and I think about it at least monthly, because something reminds me of some, something that's happening reminds me of something in the book. Yeah. And so, as opposed to, like... And so that's speculative spider, rather than, the yeah. Spider, but then it's like, there's yeah. this whole, I, is it, I guess, is it more based in, is it, is it a difference between what's based in hope or sort of aspiration versus based in anxiety. <laughs> yeah, totally. I totally get that point. And so, so in fact, so I quote an article that she wrote here in PMLA. I'm sorry, the print is so small. But she deals with that. Like she says, she makes a distinction, Atwood does, between the sort of speculation that she does versus these extravagant, you know, truly absurd stories. And she says, I actually saw, she came to Brandeis once and she said she spent a lot of time talking about how the scientific thoughts in Oryx and Crake, you know, like the, the, the gene experiments run amok, were based in reality. She's like, my brother's a biochemist. He told me about this and that. And so that sense of like this example of the chicky knobs where you grow chicken that's just a living breast and then that's it. That's it. You know, basically McNuggets, like as living beings. And she w made a point about that being completely plausible. That, yeah. That's what you mean, we right? Have, yeah, we have them. Totally. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Do you think that the, that the anxiety-based, do you think that that's going to become much more predominant? Yeah. I think that's a great question. See, the funny thing is that I think that even in Atwood, even though there is anxiety there, I don't know if you agree, but I actually think she's really funny, too. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, that is a weird thing about her. I mean, it is, it's definitely a dark vision, but it's a comically dark vision. So, 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 yeah, I totally get the point about the fantastical and speculative and the kind of hope versus the anxiety being different registers. But then I think this idea, what she says is the adventure romance coupled with Manipian satire, that's how she describes what she's doing, I think... She, you know, I think it, I think those things are knitted together, even though they're different ends of the spectrum. So I guess that's what I'd say. And I think that anxiety, I think anxiety has also always been there within science fiction. It's just that the writers we tend to remember also, um, they kind of leaven it with some kind of vision of how things could be otherwise. In fact, I really think H.G. Wells is really interesting because his first 20 years of those what he called scientific romance, they're sort of Atwood like. They're very funny. They're um, they're dark. They are showing science occasionally succeeding, but more often failing. And then you know, for those of you who know his story, like Sarah Cole has a wonderful book about Wells as socialist. He kind of got he became a true believer. 
So be, he became like a eugenicist, he became a utopian socialist. I mean, most of the things he liked, we would probably still like today, the eugenicism, not so much. But he became much less interesting as a writer. I mean, it's just generally agreed that people would like attend to him because he's really smart, but it, the stories themselves lose their edge. So I think that Atwood, in a way, although I definitely agree with you that Atwood, Atwood sits in the speculative side, not on the fantastical side, the, the, the success comes from like being willing to dwell in the, the tension, you know, and, and Wells kind of no longer was able to do that after maybe 1915. It was interesting. Just gonna check. Eric, are there any questions from Zoomers? Uh, hello. Uh, I don't see any questions right now, or they're typing very long ones. I'm not sure. <laughs> Other questions? Should I play the Vonnegut clip? It's really good. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is, this is, in a way, like I would connect this clip to the thing about the Trelf Midorians being time travelers for whom time has no meaning. Like, so Vonnegut is basically saying, what's great about science fiction is that you don't need to have an arc. You don't need to have narrative. Billy Pilgrim can just kind of pop into any moment of his own life, and that makes for an amazing story. But in this, Vonnegut tells you how he thinks people write stories, like, in real life, that are non-science fiction stories. created a body of work of startling eccentricity and universal appeal. His singular view of the world applies not just to his stories and characters, but to some of his theories as well. Well, there's no reason why the simple shapes of stories can't be fed into computers. They are beautiful shapes. <coughs> this is the GI axis, good fortune, ill fortune. Sickness and poverty down here, wealth and, and boisterous good health up there. Here's the very middle. Now, this is the B-E axis. B stands for beginning. <laughs> e stands for electricity. <laughs> now, this is an exercise in relativity, really, is the shape of the curves of what matters and not their origins. So we'll start a little above average, is why, why get a depressing person? We'll start, <coughs> the whole thing, we call this story man in hole, but it needn't be about a man, and it needn't be about somebody getting into a hole. But it's just a good way to remember it. Somebody gets into trouble, gets out of it again. People love that story. <laughs> they never get sick of it. All right, not copyrighted. Another story, also a beautiful curve and easily fed into a computer called Boy Gets Girl, but it needn't be that. Just a way to remember it. Start on an average day, average person, not expecting anything to happen a day like any other. Find something wonderful, just loves it. Oh, God damn it. Got it back again. <laughs> People like that. Now, these are beautiful curves, and this gets a little complicated. Is computers can now play chess, so I don't know why they can't digest this very difficult curve I'm going to draw for you now. And it so happens that this is the most popular story in our civilization, Western civilization. As we love to hear this story, every time it's retold, Somebody makes another million dollars. You're welcome to do it. Now, surprisingly enough, I've said it's depressing. You know, people don't like stories below, about below average days and people. But we're going to start way down here. Worse than that, who is so low? It's a little girl. What's happened? Her mother has died. Her father has remarried a vile-tempered, ugly woman with, with two nasty daughters, big daughters. You've heard it. She... Anyway, there's a party at the palace that night. She can't go. She has to help everybody else get ready. She has to stay home. Now, does she sink lower? No. She's a staunch little girl, and she has had the maximum whack from fate, which is the loss of her mother, as she, 
She can't go any lower than that. Okay, so the fairy godmother comes. Gives her shoes, gives her stocking, gives her mascara. <laughs> gives her a means of transportation. Goes to the party. Dances with the prince, has a swell time. Boring, 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 boring. Now there's a slight inclination to that line as I've drawn it because it takes perhaps 20 seconds, 30 seconds for a grandfather clock to strike 12. Does she wind up at the same level? Of course not. She will remember that dance for the rest of her life. Now, she poops along on this level till the prince comes to shoe fits. She achieves off-scale happiness. <laughs> Vonnegut's point is the same point that he makes in Slaughterhouse Five when he says about Brothers Karamazov that it's just not enough anymore. Like he's he loves telling that story, but he partly loves telling that story because like his science fiction is actually trying to do something different. Like it's that is what it means to go, you know. Like he has this one called Galapagos, where human beings evolve into seal flipper like people. The only way we're going to survive is if we don't have opposable thumbs anymore. So he's just, you know, he's given up on the conventional narrative and he's going in these weird directions. And, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, audience, for coming